Welcome to Our Justice Journey, a podcast designed to educate others on how to fight for social justice as youth and beyond. Today we'll be interviewing social justice warrior, Dr. Maisha Wynn. Maisha Wynn is the Associate Dean and Chancellor's Leadership Professor in the School of Education at UC Davis, where she co-founded and co-directs the Transformative Justice and Education Center. Maisha Wynn's research spans a wide variety of understanding settings, including her earlier work on the literate practices extant in bookstores and community organizations in the African-American community, to her most recent works in settings where adolescent girls are incarcerated. She was also born and raised in Sacramento, California. In today's podcast, Dr. Maisha Wynn will discuss the intersection of higher education and justice, offering insight on her experience with social change. She's an admirable scholar activist, and we are pleased to have the opportunity to learn from her today. So thank you for being here again. Our first question, if you're ready to get started, is what is the difference between education and schooling? Oh, wow. Let's just start a little lightweight, will we? (laughs) Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And I am so glad that you asked that question because I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, well, first of all, I should say that my a lot of my um, worldview is influenced by uh, two parents who were movement makers, movement builders, and contributors uh, in the 1970s and, and late 1960s to a lot of social justice movements for Black liberation, and uh, more specifically, the urging of institutions to implement Uh, Black history into uh, Black history, culture, perspectives, worldviews into all disciplines, not just for Black studies programs, but for uh, English departments and history departments and political science and sociology departments to all make sure that they were taking into account the Black experience. So that certainly um, informs my worldview on this notion of education versus schooling. So I will say that I was My understanding of my own school experience from my parents um, was that we go to school to learn how to be in relationship with lots of different kinds of people, to learn how to quote unquote deal with lots of kinds of people, Um, that school is about a larger social world that you have to kind of know, engage in various settings with different people, sometimes people who don't like you, sometimes people who are not treating you well, um, and you have to learn how to power through that how to shine from the inside out. So I was always taught that school was this place, uh, a social institution. My education, however, uh, again, in the context of my growing up was something that I obtained really through literature, through public engagement, whether it be, you know, lectures, speakers, art galleries, Um, any kind of space where people were thinking and dreaming and creating. And so uh, when I was little, um, and this is much like you and your brother, uh, my parents took us everywhere with them. We, um, it it wasn't about like children's story hour. We We would go to all things. We were learning, there was no sort of age appropriate um, events, whatever the events were, people were talking uh, um, exchanging ideas, debating, discussing. We went to those kinds of activities and events with our parents, which is not to say we didn't do child-centered things. Um, but I learned that an education was something that certainly started with your own um, value system at home. Um, it started with the world. Um, and certainly there were elder members of my family who did not have the opportunity to go to four-year college university. Um, and they were some of the most brilliant people. They were the people who built the capacity for the rest of us to be able to go to school. They had a vision and they executed their vision and they wanted to make things so that the next generations could get an education formally. But also I think about what great thinkers they were even without a so-called formal education. So um, I do want to also lift up that one of my favorite books is by a scholar named Wally Mushuja. It's called Too Much Schooling, Too Little Education, where he actually argues that Black children in particular receive a good amount of schooling, but they don't always get an education in schools. And so that's one of my reference points when I think about the relationship between education and schooling. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I find whenever I ask this question, a lot of people do not 
look at um, school as a parallel of education, which I think is really interesting, especially in America, is that education really happens, it seems, outside of classrooms and in the world. Well, um, sometimes schooling is just doesn't really teach you or educate you. It's more just checking off um, boxes and stuff like that um, and so forth. So, yeah, I think that's just really interesting. I always like to ask that question. Um, My next question is, yeah, my next question is, why did you start the Transformative Justice Center at UC Davis? Oh, that's a that's a great question as well. Um, well, we saw an opportunity. We, my partner Lawrence Tory Wynn and I saw an opportunity to really merge the different visions we had. Um, when we first met, one of our connecting points was that he had worked with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated boys in Newark, New Jersey. I had worked with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated girls in the Southeast. And um, through that work and that experience, we had so much in common in terms of the, the ways in which learning the different stories of these young people and also the um, ways in which they were routed and caught up and ensnared in uh, what Damien Sojourner might call educational enclosures, that is experiences in the school that um, did not support robust learning or intellectual work, but were really about body management and a lot of punishment. So many of the young people that we met, they started a life of punishment early in school. So they were used to being punished and used to being in trouble. Um, and I think that work simultaneously haunted both of us and inspired us. And we were always thinking about how we could bring um, my experience as an educator, his experience as someone who went to law school and worked in nonprofits, my work as an education researcher, and then our work as educational researchers together under one roof. So the Transformative Justice and Education Center is our um sort of dream lab, if you will, to think about design, support grad student researchers who are interested in designing worlds where education, i.e. our first part of our conversation is possible, potentially in schools and in other spaces if schools are not um, meeting those needs. Uh, we uh, tend to attract uh, justice and equity oriented scholars. We're unapologetically focused on those issues. We are very um, interested in how we um, teach and create teaching opportunities um, that disrupt, um, not only disrupt uh, educational enclosures, but also dream about what's possible and what's next. So we are decidedly not reactionary. We really try to think about what structures we want to put in place of the very things that we're trying to fight against. So we are transformative justice practitioners, meaning restorative justice, that is the art and science of making things right, is the foundation of our work. So everything that we do it, it is led with what we call, um, what Kay Pranis calls a restorative impulse. We try to work from a place of non-domination. Of course, we're always working against that and, and toward that because that, that, is a, that is constant work that you have to keep um, dealing with. Um, we uh, want to cultivate a sense of purpose and belonging, particularly for grad student researchers and, and scholars throughout the country to come and have a refuge to talk about big ideas. Um, ideas that may not fit neatly in any of our disciplines, but that are really inter- and transdisciplinary in nature. And um, we want people to be able to come and create and think. So we have a practitioner in residence program where we invite people who are on the ground doing the work, teachers, artists, um, people who have their own nonprofits to come and think with us and uh, share some of their ideas uh, we love for our undergrad students, our grad students, and our colleagues to learn from and with the different practitioners. Uh, we also have a speaker series, and we've invited some wonderful thinkers to kind of push us. And people who also are, are sharing things that are new to us. You know, our first practitioner in residence was Roger Viet Chung with the Asian Prisoner Support Committee. Uh, he was the first person I ever heard talk about uh, the Asian prisoner 
uh, uh, experience as part of anti-Blackness. Like, I mean, he was just sharing things and pushing us in ways that we just, things we hadn't really thought about. And um, I think it's really interesting sort of coming full circle. Uh, we had a graduate student researcher last year, Wayne Jopanda, and we had him working on the Asian Futures Project. So uh, fairly soon we will be um, putting a resource guide on our website about Asian and Black American uh, solidarity work in California. So uh, we've grown and we've grown because of the people who come and seek refuge at the center. Um, so we've expanded our minds and our hearts and uh, always keeping restorative justice at the center of the work. Wow, I think that all sounds really, really dope. Everything that you said, and just as a follow up, if you mind, if I ask, how did you go about really starting it? Were you just, did you like go to the chancellor and you're just like, hey, that sounds like a great idea? Or like, did you guys have to really like go through some steps to like prove certain things and then you're given the center? I guess, how exactly did you get it started oh, when you were on the campus? That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. So the way universities work, um, Let's see, I, I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, prior to coming to UC Davis. And um, when the possibility of coming to Davis was becoming a reality, one of the things that I asked for, because I was very interested in doing this and, and we were poised to do this at the University of Wisconsin-Madison was to start a research center that was centered on restorative and transformative justice the then Dean in the School of Education, Harold Levine, um, thought it sounded like an idea and, you know, talked to different people at the time. Um, Linda Katehi was the uh, chancellor and um, Ralph Hexter was the provost. Uh, they were very supportive of the idea. And we were very fortunate that when we got a new chancellor, uh, Chancellor May, he was also incredibly supportive uh, and even came and participated in a restorative justice circle early in his time, which is not the easiest thing to do because it's a very um, it's a very vulnerable space. And I think to be a high level administrator and to put yourself in this space of being on the same level with students and staff and faculty uh, was an incredible um not to him believing in the work enough to participate in the process. So, uh, so yeah, I think it just took a lot of people believing in it. And, and we had a, an, I, you know, we pitched the idea, of course, we had a proposal and we'd worked on a vision statement with one of our dear colleagues, Sujatha Baliga, who's one of the leading restorative justice attorneys in the country. We had her go over it with us. And we've, you know, since, since we've grown, we've changed it a little bit. And I think one thing that the university saw too was that there were a lot of graduate students who had research questions and interests in the kind of work that we were doing. And they really wanted to support, they knew supporting us was also supporting our students. Got you, that all sounds really dope. Thank you for breaking that down. Um, yes. Yeah, as a follow-up question, not a follow-up, but just as another question, um, was there any particular moment or experience in your life that you felt like you wanted social change to be your career or to be a driving force in what you do every day? Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if there was a particular moment, but I was, I was actually just, I did a podcast with some colleagues and I, one of the things that I shared with them is that my mother, uh, in my opinion, was a justice warrior. She was a justice warrior in her everyday life. She demanded that people were honest and that people did the right thing. And she didn't let things go. And I think as a kid, there's different moments when you're seeing your parents and you're kind of like, you get worried because you're your kid, you, 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 you do care about decorum and everything being in order. And, and I would say, Oh, mom, we don't have to make a big deal out of it. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. And she's like, yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my gosh, she's going to make a big deal out of whatever this thing was. But when I look back, all those things that she was, in my opinion, making a big deal of, they needed that they needed someone to go and speak up. And so she was always that person. And she, to me, I feel like she would sometimes be the only one who was demanding that the right thing happen. And I just kept thinking, gosh, it's like, I think earlier I thought that's a lonely path, right? Like, 
you know, pushing these ideas and trying to get people to see things differently. And when there was a situation when someone in the family experienced harm and she was the one person in the family who had this vision for um, connecting with the family of the harmers and trying to make things right with them as opposed to having any sort of outside influences, you no know, law enforcement, that sort of thing. And I think people kind of thought, I don't know about that. And I, I didn't have the language of restorative justice or I didn't, I didn't know any of that when I was a kid, but I remember thinking what she's trying to do is revolutionary. This is really different. Like going to the people who are part of this group that harmed and trying to have a conversation and see what we can do on our own. I just remember thinking this is unbelievable. And I also felt bad because I feel like she, I mean, she tried to do it and the people on the harming end, um, they didn't know what to do with it. They were kind of, um, they turned her away. They, they said, oh, you know, if the kids did something wrong, they did something wrong. They're just going to get in trouble, whatever. Like they blew it off. And I remember how sad she was that they couldn't even see that this was an opportunity to potentially reroute their children in a different direction and to um, think about a more innovative way of um, supporting our young people. And I didn't have the words, but I knew that that was mind blowing to me. And I admired her so much for that. Uh, and I never forgot that. And so when I did learn about restorative justice, I always would go back to that moment, that, that incident and say, this was an example. This is what she was trying to do. Uh, and, um, and everybody's not ready. Everybody's not ready for this work. Yeah. I think that's so dope. But especially when you're talking about your mom, that like, I think about it, like that deep sense of humanity, that deep sense of compassion that it's just like, you know, someone can always be brought back to light and they don't deserve just to, you know, have to bring in law enforcement or just to have to be one thing to mess up their entire life. So I just think that's really amazing um, when you're speaking on that. And that's kind of what came to mind. But also, I know you talked about your mom, but is there any ancestor activist that really inspires you? And if so, why? Oh, wow. I remember when I first read about Ida B. Wells, I was just like, where has she been all my life? <laughs> um and this is such a funny thing. I mean, my father taught uh, African-American history and black history and our house was full of books like all over the place. And I remember when I was a first year at UC Davis as an undergrad and I took, you know, the first African-American studies class, like the foundation class. And um, then I took a class called African-American Intellectuals and we read um, a biography of Ida B. Wells. And I came home and I'm like, you didn't tell me about Ida B. Wells. I just can't, like, I can't believe it. And my dad, he literally says nothing. Like, I'm, I'm like, we read Paul Robeson. We read Angela Davis's autobiography. We read all these autobiographies and biographies. And I'm coming home, like, accusing him of not teaching me these things. He quietly walks over to one of our bazillion bookshelves. And he just, like, points to, like, this, this whole roll of books. Like, all these books are right there. They're all there. And I'm thinking I went to school and learned something different. And I'm like, how did you not tell me? And he's like, it's, it's all been here for you. Just waiting for you to figure it out. Like I can lead you to the water, but you have got to drink it yourself. And it's so true, right? Like then I, I read about Ida B. Wells with one of my professors. And then I'm thinking this woman's amazing. And my parents are like, yeah, but you could have learned about her right here. So um, I just think about her positionality as a woman, as a black woman who was seeing things again, here's someone who's seeing things and saying, this is not right. Um, you know, launching an anti-lynching, uh, vision and campaign and going hard and writing and making sure that the word got out for her to do what she did in those times. It, it's, it's so powerful and it speaks to how we all can be doing something and we can do more and that it's possible. And she didn't have the protections that many of us have now, you know? Um, so yeah, so Ida B. Wells, I would say is certainly um, one of my social justice ancestors. Yes, she is so inspiring. Um, yeah, just like, 
especially um I just think also when you think about like journalism today and like writing and stuff like that um even today a lot of people it's just very one-sided um but when you think of her doing it back then and the cause she was doing it for like that is just mind-blowing it is it really is yeah and for my next question um with your center or just in your career in general how do you work to bridge the gap between secondary schools and higher education experiences Hmm, that's a really good question. So bridging the gap. Well, I, throughout my work, have positioned myself very much as a secondary person, secondary meaning focused on middle school, high school, that age range, grades seventh or sixth through 12th in terms of my work. And I really, um, and I don't think this is a good thing. I think I was really, you know, kind of focused on that group, that age group. And I think early on, a lot of work pointed towards how you're going to prepare kids for college. Um, and I knew that I wanted students prepared, not just to go to college, but even beyond, right? Like, and not just get to college, but have the ability to have agency at the university to have a sense of why they wanted to study and the purpose for studying and also to acknowledge and um, and uh, be okay with a little struggling being a part of studying. So I always had, this kind of goes back to the conversation about education versus schooling. I think there are so many opportunities at the university to focus in on um, particular disciplines. And sometimes I just think if young people could get there and experience that and immerse themselves in that, that it would just blow their minds, particularly kids who may not know or understand what this looks like and feels like. Um, and I think now, um, now when I think about my work, I talk about five pedagogical stances and the fifth stance is futures matter. And when I talk about futures matter, I talk about young people being able to imagine multiple paths forward for themselves and to really think expansively about learning and different ways that they can learn. And certainly we still see a um, formal education, particularly for multiply marginalized children, students as, um, you know, it's still the currency of the day to a certain extent. And we also have to think about this entrepreneurial spirit and this these abilities to engage in digital media practices that also can, um, they're way beyond me. <laughs> I don't know, I don't profess to know everything about them, but young people have a lot of different ways of communicating now and of, um, you know, uh, connecting with the rest of the world. And I mean the world, not just locally or nationally, but globally. And so I think there are some things that are so exciting. So I, I believe that our universities have to have spaces where they're learning from young people as well and really listening to young people about the kinds of lives um, that they're imagining for themselves. I think young people have a better handle on language and identities. And so there's a lot of ways in which we can be led so to me, and I don't know if I would even call it a gap, I think this road or, oh, what's a good metaphor? I don't know, this space uh, that one sort of would imagine between the, the high school, the 12th grade and to the university could be a lot smaller. Um, and I think that, you know, work that like your mom did with making sure that high school students got to come on the campuses and spend time and hear from scholars and enjoy their time on campus, see the, the, the dynamic encounters that one can have through connecting with other people who are interested in ideas. That to me is the university. It's not just what are you majoring in? It's the connecting point of lots of ideas and visions. And I think we need to pitch it that way more so. Um, the connecting of ideas of minds to me is a uh, a more accurate reflection of the kind of education that I think young people want and deserve. Mm, I really, I really like that line because especially since I'm applying to like starting to apply to like college and stuff like that, the idea that, you know, the university or college or wherever you may go as your next step is not just like a next step in 
you know, more school or just like tiring or more stuff like that, but really a connection of minds. I think that, and just to really elevate yourself in that sense, I think that's really important. And I really, that really just like spoke to me right now, um, especially just thinking about that next step. Yes, absolutely. Just think about all the, I mean, I think more, okay, when I think about my time at the university, I think about the people who I connected with, the books that I read, Yes, coursework is is a part of as the guiding part of that. But I, when I think about the relationships that were formed, and the ways in which particular relationships pushed me, maybe those relationships were with faculty, maybe they were with a staff member and student support services, or maybe they were with my peers, with other classmates. Uh, and so when I think about that, I think those are we we undersell those when we talk about the university because we don't talk about them in terms of what it really boils down to for us are those connections and those relationships. So when I'm talking to people about the the university, I usually focus on on that space, um, the relational space. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful. Um, My next question is, how do you feel scholarship can be used to mobilize groups of people? And have you witnessed some examples of this in your own life or in your work? So one of my um, other sort of heroes, or uh, I I forgot how you worded it, but uh, social justice activists, no, ancestors. (laughs) So uh, my father is a historian, so I draw a lot from history and historians, and one of his um, uh, heroes was John Hope Franklin. And John Hope Franklin wrote a book called From Slavery to Freedom, which has had many editions. And he wrote that book when uh, history scholars were saying, well, we would love to teach about the Black experience, but we don't have a book. We don't have a textbook for that. So John Hope Franklin said, I'll fix that. And From Slavery to Freedom became, um, it was a staple in history classes um, and kept getting updated and updated because our history, histories, um, keep getting updated. We keep learning about stuff. We keep discovering things. We keep finding, you know, archival material in grandma's closet or whatever, wherever it is, you know. So we are still collecting and learning, which is exciting. It's living history. So one of the things that John Hope Franklin talks about is how your scholarship is your activism. So while some people might see um, publications, publishing and writing as being uh, luxurious and maybe not important and disconnected, he wrote a book that changed the way that people taught a particular subject and discipline. People who said they couldn't teach it because they didn't have a tool. And he said, we can fix that. And so I always think about that idea that your scholarship can be your activism. You have to get your work into the hands of the people. You know, I always talk about the E40 approach. Like you have to get your materials out. He got his CDs out from his tapes or I don't know what he had at the time, but from his trunk of his car, right? And so we can't just, you know, store our books and stuff on the shelf and expect people to just find it. We have to get copies out to people. We have to um, do work with learning communities and share the work and put it in people's hands. And um, so for me, I think that the, the there are so many aspects of the writing and, and having people be able to hold something and reflect and build with it, use it as a tool for conversation and not necessarily agree with it, challenge and push it. I think that's an important part of, you know, what I like to put out in the world because people can still grapple with it. Like my book, Justice on Both Sides, I was just doing a um, a workshop for teacher educators today. And it was so incredible to know that people were still reading the book and um, raising important questions and applying it to their context. And so that work can kind of live on and continue to um inspire and raise questions. Yeah, for sure. I think that's definitely a good point. I do think sometimes there is a very much, people think there's a very much disconnect um, in what you write and getting it into the hands of the people, right? But it's yeah. it's as much one thing as in the other, I guess, writing and producing that work, but also getting it into the hands that need it and need that knowledge. Um, so I think that was just a really good point to say there. Um, and my next question is, what role do youth have in social activism? 
Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that question. Um, well, maybe we should start with some definitions. Um, so uh, I have a colleague named Lorena Marquez in the Chicano, Chicana, Chicana Studies Department who wrote this gorgeous book called La Gente about the Chicano movement in Sacramento. And it's, it, it resonates for me having grown up in Sacramento, but also because of uh, Professor Marquez's beautiful writing and the way that she tells these stories of everyday people, parents who just wanted their kids to go to, you know, get a get a solid education, and not just go to school, get a good education, um, who wanted uh, their rights and humanity acknowledged in the workplace, um, and that while we tend to lean towards or think about these big famous figures that there were really just some everyday folks engaged in this work, la gente, the people. And so when I think about my own sense of activism, I think that activism shows up in so many things that I do. Activism shows up in my parenting. It shows up in the way that I have to engage on behalf of my children in schools. Um, it shows up in the way that I have to advocate for myself and other colleagues. Um, and especially women, women of color. So there's sort of like these, to me, it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of everyday battles. They may seem mundane. They're not, um, they, they don't get attention. They're not things that you put on social media, but they are everyday things that you're having to do uh, to push people to make sure that it's not just right for you and your kids, but it's right for other people who are going to come, you know, behind you or might be right beside you. So I know that when I advocate for my kids, for example, I'm creating a space that will be a space of advocacy for other Black children. If I'm advocating for myself in the workplace, it may be something that um, is supporting other women scholars who are there um, and maybe some sort of intersectionality of that. Uh, women scholars who are also parents or women of scholars who are women of color, you know, that sort of thing. So when I think about my daily activism or I, I think I inserted daily, when I think about my social activism, I think about the daily, the mundane, the things that I really think we shouldn't have to fight for. <laughs> Uh, but here we are. And um, so they're the things that people may not see all the time, but there's something that happens almost every day, um, if not at least a few times a week. Uh, and and I think we don't talk about that enough, that people are having battles uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, encounters. Yeah, I really like how you put that, um, the idea that social change is not just like when you attend a protest or when you write, you know, you give a speech or whatever the case may be, but social change and doing good is a lifestyle. Um, and I just think, I don't know, that really, that really sits with me a lot because I think it's not only about what we do, let's say, um, after, or it's not only what we do like on the clock or whatever the case may be, whoever, you know, may apply to, but um, it's really about what we do off of it and what we do in our daily lives and who we are after that or who we are after the cameras or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, I, I really, I really, really like that. Um, so thank you for giving me that new perspective and probably giving our listeners, um, a new perspective as well. Thank you. And then for our last question, um, what is your motivation to fight for social justice in your career and life every day? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, when I think about, I'm going to circle back to Ida B. Wells, but also I think about people like Angela Davis. I am a, I love Angela Davis so much. Um, I, right before the pandemic hit us in 2019, I was in Madison. I was speaking at an event and she was speaking at UW Madison and I went, I got to go to her talk and I was just blown away by her ability, all the fighting and struggle that did on all of our behalf for our humanity, for our dignity, um, that she still has so much energy <laughs> and she was talking specifically about her, um, how inspired she was by young people and how young people had maybe even a greater facility with words, with language, with fluidity that 
um, perhaps activists in the 60s and 70s didn't have. Um, she also talked about there being a time, this really brought me to tears actually, when she and her comrades would wake up in the morning and expect that the revolution would have arrived and it hadn't. And I kept thinking about what it, how it would feel to really think like tomorrow is the day it's going down tomorrow. And then you wake up and it still didn't go down. And I think we had a few of those moments in 2020 where we thought we're going to turn the ship around. Like we're going to, everybody's paying attention. Um, we're going to, you know, do this. That's the closest I feel like I've felt in my life of like, maybe tomorrow we're going to get up and this is going to be a different thing. So I thought about that all those mornings she got up and things still hadn't quite changed um, the way she imagined that she still was fighting. So I feel very, for me to keep going, it's like the very least of what I could do. Um, also, I have a dear colleague, Erica Miners. Um, she wrote a, she's written several books, but one of my favorite books is Right to be Hostile, Schools, Prisons, and the Making of Public Enemies. And I remember reading that book and Erica talks about, um, you know, she's like, I have a lot of activist friends, people who work in nonprofits who do this. They don't have an office at the university and they don't have a healthcare plan. And so, you know, that I, I, I connected with her very early in my career and those kinds of things really changed my, my vision. Like there's, there's no time to, to be tired. One of my mentors is Carol Lee, um, who before she even started as a um, an educational researcher at the university, as many of us know her, she was already an institution builder. She had already started a, an African-centered preschool um, uh, as well as two additional schools and was doing that kind of work. So I, in my mind, it's like, there's no, <laughs> you don't stop. You just keep doing it. There's no excuses really because to whom much is given, much is required. There's that, but there's also like, there's plenty of models for getting the work done. Like we do it because, you know, it has to be done, you know, and I'm not going to wait for somebody else. Mm, I love that. And that the idea of like our motivations and our moving forward is all kind of interconnected with each other and all um, in the past, in the future, in the present, in all those fields. Um, so that was our last question. Um, we thank you, Dr. Maisha Wynn, once again, for being such an amazing contribution to this discussion and hope to continue connecting with you in the future. Thank you again to our listeners for being a part of this discussion as well. We hope that you enjoyed our podcast. Make sure to keep up to date with new stories and interviews in the near future.